Good evening, friends. Good day, depending on what part of the world you are in. Welcome to uh, my YouTube channel on transformative psychology. Um, the topic today is rather quite heavy. It's the second stage in transformative psychology. And it's the stage where we are going to be exploring the nature and dynamics of love. I know as soon as I mentioned the word love, many of you, um, probably your mind, your heart, you know, goes in different directions because love is such a powerful phenomenon. Um, in fact, it has been known throughout history that it's one of the most misunderstood, most sought after idea. It is what has turned the world around and turned the world upside down a thousand times over. So discussing the question of love, understanding love is actually incredibly complex. And I've been quite hesitant in trying to actually talk about the idea of love because there are so many dimensions to it. And uh, I've been hesitant because I just feel that every attempt I make is going to fall short. Um, but I'm forcing myself to come to this camera here today and actually start talking about it because uh, I need to, I have to. <laughs> so um, forgive me for any shortcomings uh, in this, uh, this regard, but um, I hope this, uh, through a process, we will uh, try to uh, build on the different pieces. Um, think of love as a hundred thousand piece puzzle and every piece has a place, every piece composes the tapestry of the bigger picture of what love is. Um, there is a beautiful passage by the beloved master that talks about love in a very succinct way and says, what a power is love. It is the most wonderful, the greatest of all living powers. Love gives life to the lifeless. Love lights a flame in the heart that is cold. Love brings hope to the hopeless and gladdens the heart of the sorrowful. In the world of existence, there is indeed no greater power than the power of love. When the heart of man is aglow with the flame of love, he is ready to sacrifice all, even his life. In the gospel, it is said, God is love. As you can see, there is a lot there. Um, how is this related to psychology? It's uh, the emotional valley. It's the ability to develop emotional intelligence. Um, to be able to love intelligently, to self-regulate. As I have briefly alluded to in one of my videos, you can think of love as uh, the mother of all emotions. For example, if you examine whenever you feel joy or happiness, you are moving closer to the object of your love. Doesn't matter what that object is. It could be a person that you deeply care about. It could be a material thing like money. It could be going on a vacation that brings you joy and happiness. It could be an idea that you stand for and you champion. Anytime you're moving close, closer to the object of your love, you begin to feel joy. So that's one of the conditions. But of course, the opposite of that is that we feel pain, we feel sadness, whenever we lose the object of our love. We feel anxiety and distress whenever the object of love is threatened. We feel anger whenever we perceive some form of injustice towards the object of love. So love plays a huge role in our emotions. It takes us high and it drops us down. So 
for those of you who've been heartbroken, um, obviously you experience that. For those of you who have fallen into the romantic phase of love, you know the madness of love and how it can consume an individual. There are many, many elements of love. So what we are trying to do in the second valley of transformative psychology, understand the power of love and be able to learn strategies in self-regulating. I hope that is clear. Now, to set the foundation before we move into the micro work, the practical elements of how to control and manage the power of love within our psychology, within our relationships, I need to sort of build a foundation, talk about the different elements or aspects of love. So in today's video, I'm actually going to keep it short because I'm going to lay the big picture of the four types of love ontologically. And this is very central because understanding these four types of love on a hierarchical level, on an ontological categorization is extremely important later on when we come to answer some more in-depth questions and then be able to find solutions to how to self-regulate emotionally. So it's all related and I hope you will have the, the patience um, and um, give the time to actually critically think about the things that I'm sharing with you, humbly sharing with you. These are not my ideas. These are ideas that great people, uh, both in terms of philosophy, divine philosophy and scientists have already introduced and I'm just simply humbly bringing it to your attention in a manner that will support development, support what transformative psychology is all about. Okay, so let's get started and we shall move forward. Now, one small note that I want to point out is this idea of hypothetical construct. In science, hypothetical construct is basically any phenomenon that can only be understood by way of association or through the signs they produce, but never directly. So love is actually a hypothetical construct. Intelligence is a hypothetical construct. Gravity, hypothetical construct. These are things that you cannot actually, you know, have any direct connection with through your senses, but you come to understand them and associate with them through their signs. Another way of thinking about this is to separate the idea of essence of a thing versus the properties or the qualities of this thing. And here's a beautiful quote by the master that identifies this particular point, and I think it's great for your reflection. It highlights that know that there are two kinds of knowledge. The knowledge of the essence of something, of a thing, and the knowledge of its qualities. The essence of a thing is known through its qualities. Otherwise, it is unknown and hidden. So, we are going to, when you think about love, there are many elements or aspects of love. The essence of love, and this four ontological categorization, you're going to see that the essence of love can only be understood through the relative, um, to the relative, based on our relative capacity in detecting the attributes and qualities of that which we come to identify. Now, what are we talking about in terms of uh, the four signs? Um, in science, we typically talk about the fact that there are iconic signs, indexical signs, conventional signs, and in divine philosophy, we also understand the concept of spiritual signs, which now in quantum physics is also becoming more clear and there is synergy and harmony that is developing between science and true religion. But as you can see here on this chart, 
iconic signs are anything that is a representation of something but not this not that thing in itself so a photo of yourself or a map of the world is not actually the world it's a representation so it's an iconic sign of the world indexical signs are what most used in science and in understanding and the development of science. So a very simple example is that heat and combustion. Where there is heat, there is combustion. Where there is smoke, there is fire. This is a way in which we come to determine and understand the nature and operation of the physical world. Conventional signs are what we come to in agreement and those can be changed. Conventional signs can be changed. But traffic signs, for example, that we've developed for our own safety is an example of something that we have developed and designed through a collective agreement that benefits us. And of course, spiritual signs is a combination of, you might say, looking at quantum physics and revelation is the harmony of science and true religion there was a, I believe a physicist who by the name of I um, can't remember his name right now he was he was essentially described as the father of modern um, of quantum physics and he said something that was quite remarkable and uh, I think what he pointed out was uh, Warner Heisenberg, that's it, Warner Heisenberg. And he said, some would, um, he says, the first gulp, think of, you know, um, the investigation of science and natural sciences as drinking water. He says, the first gulp from the glass of natural science will make you an atheist. But at the bottom of the, of the glass, God is waiting. In other words, what he's pointing out is that you see God in everything and everywhere. And I think this is really, really important because when I come to describe the first type of love, very important for those who have moved towards um, becoming an atheist in their worldview um, and justifiably so, because a lot of people hold this old traditional notion and understanding of God, perhaps like the old man with the beard looking upon us and so forth. And I think, you know, it's time for humanity to mature and really think deeply about the elements of what quantum physics is telling us and how we can come close to understanding the nature and dynamics of our creator or we would describe as God in something that is far more sophisticated, more majestic, more beautiful, more awe-inspiring. And so when we explore the first type of love, shortly I will describe that. But going back to what I was just uh, pointing out is that spiritual signs can be understood through quantum physics but also understood through the power of divine revelation. And this is where you see the beautiful harmony of science and true religion. And I picked out this beautiful quote by the Universal House of Justice. It says, it has become customary in the West to think of science and religion as occupying two distinct and even opposed areas of human thought and activity. This dichotomy can be characterized in the pairs of antitheses of such as fate and reason, value and fact. The principle of the harmony of science and religion means not only that religious teaching should be studied with the light of reason and evidence, as well as of fate and inspiration but also that everything in this creation, all aspects of human life and knowledge should be studied in the light of revelation as well as in that of purely 
rational investigation. So, as you all know, in the videos that I've talked about, transformative psycho this is this is very very important. I'm reiterating it over and over again. Transformative psychology is the merger of this progressive, evolving divine revelation, the divine philosophy that guides us, and the ability of science, scientific methodologies harmonizing together to allow us to open our eyes to the greater elements of the outer world and to also our inner world. And so you have to really be critical, you have to be open-minded, you have to, like we talked about in the Valley of Search, relieve yourself of those prejudices or superstitions and dogmas that oftentimes blind us and hold us back from investigating truth. So you might want to go back and study the first valley, the Valley of Search and Discovery, and then be able to prepare yourself to actually engage in this study of the nature and dynamics of love because it's very powerful and it has lots of beneficial factors that as you will come to apply in your own life. Okay, so the first kind of love um, that is described, this is a beautiful passage um, in, in the Seven Valleys and later the master sort of elaborates on it but it's the love of god towards the self of god i mean the first time i was introduced to this i read this i had not actually thought about it i go what does that mean the love of god towards the self of god the self or identity of god it was a new sort of an undertaking in my mind to even consider it um, let alone contemplate on it and uh, as I started to allow myself to be open to this idea of trying to understand it, um, I came to the explanation that the Master provided as the basis of my meditation and reflection. And as I have put it down here in this chart, this referring to this first type of love, the highest type of love, uh, the Master says, this is the transfiguration of his beauty, the reflection of himself in the mirror of his creation. Isn't that beautiful? Just, just the way it's described? Wow. This is the reality of love, the ancient love, the eternal love. Through one ray of this love, all other love exists. I mean, this is incredible. That's why I think it's so beautiful when Warner Heisenberg, the father of quantum physics, when he talked about the fact that, yes, essentially the first gulp of natural science, you become an atheist and then you go to the bottom of the cup and you begin to see God in everything. I think this is like a wonderful way of really maturing our perspective that the essence of God is in everything everything there is nothing within all of creation this world the next world parallel universes everything is part of the essence of god now as i said in the first part essence remains hidden and unknown unless you come to discover it unless you begin to understand its attributes and so as we move to other aspects in this ontological categorization of love we begin to distill and refine our understanding of the different ways that the love of god is expressed the second type is the expression of the love god's love through the medium of progressive revelation and here the master describes the love that flows from god to man it consists of the inexhaustible graces, the divine effulgence and heavenly illumination. Through this love, the world of being receives life. Through this love, man is endowed with physical existence until through the breath of the Holy Spirit, the same love, he receives eternal life and becomes the image of the living God. This love is the origin of 
all the love in the world of creation. Wow. You see how beautiful, how systematically it puts in place? So what this is referring to in terms of progressive revelation, the word of God, is every 500 to 1,000 years, there is this incredible, from time to time, this incredible light that shines into the world through the point of an individual person, but who is not really who is superhuman the best way i can describe it it is there's no words that can describe the the station of the manifestations of god or the founders of the world religions that have come like krishna and buddha and moses and zoroastra and jesus and muhammad and of course the latest one the bab and baha'u'llah in the past 175 odd years that has been um, the new light and the teachings that have come to humanity. So we see that the essence of all faith, of all religion is one, but it's progressive based on the capacity for us to receive it. So think of it in context of like in grade one, you have a teacher who knows a lot more than he or she will disclose and teach to you, like a math teacher might teach you know, a child, two plus two is four, but they may know how to teach the child algebra and calculus, but it may be too early because the child will not be able to comprehend, right? And so the job of the grade one teacher is to prepare the child and not only for grade two, but also to give it the knowledge that is able and capable of receiving. It builds its capacity and as the child matures and goes to the next level, the next grade and the next grade, new knowledge comes forth. So this idea of the second type of love is essentially talking about progressive revelation. That religious truth is not absolute, it's progressive. That for every time and age there is an ailment and a problem and there's a new remedy, a new medicine that comes into the world a new solution and the solution that has come of the latest religion of the Baha'i faith is essentially the solution towards disunity or the solution, the elixir of unity. How can we achieve unity in context of our diversity? And so this process is something you need to investigate about progressive revelation. But for the topic of what we are discussing here today without going into too depth, is understanding that this is a categorically a very unique element and aspect of love that we need to sort of develop our capacity to understand, contemplate and consider in a mature way and ask critical questions. This is very important. In the past, people just absorbed information without critical thinking. And if you do that, not only critical thinking on what's being said, but also being critical to yourself. So often when dogma and superstition take hold of us, psychologically, we're not being critical enough of ourselves. We find a nice cozy spot in our mind and we want to sort of ignore the rest because we just don't want to place the effort or maybe for what multiple reasons why we may not be critical of our own perspective. So always having this kind of compassionate, open, humble posture of learning towards learning what is it that you hold within yourself questioning what you know and also being open to other people's ideas. And so understanding the second type of love, this progressive revelation, this concept is something that I would definitely encourage you to investigate more on your own. The third type of love in this hierarchy that we're talking about in this ontological is the expression of human beings love towards God. Here the master describes this is fate, attraction to the divine, enkindlement, progress, entrance into the kingdom of God, receiving the bounties of God, illumination with the lights of the kingdom. This love is the origin of all philanthropy this love causes the heart of men to reflect, to reflect the rays of the sun of reality. 
Now, this part is, I think, connected to the second type of love because, you know, this uh, picture that I have here is Plato's cave, as some of you are familiar with. And the allegory and story behind it is like how um, our perspectives are shaped by the limitations of our understanding. So as you can see, those in the bottom of the cave, they're looking at the shadows that are fallen from the light onto the wall. And they think, oh my goodness, that is reality. This is what it is. And they have no idea about what is on the outside, but that becomes their reality. And they can fight and they can live and everything becomes within that limited element of the shadow. But as they begin to move upwards and out of the cave, they come and behold a greater reality. This is progress. Progress is the expansion of our consciousness. Progress is the ability for us to develop both technology and spirituality and morality, the refinement of human character. That's progress. And when you have that together, you know, the material and the spiritual progress is light upon light. And so the idea of the expression of human beings' love towards God is the recognition of that which is good, that which is beautiful. So normally what will happen here is that when you, uh, it's kind of like an order form, at least the way I see it, is that when you, many people feel the essence of God or life. Every human being, you know, I've seen in my practice hundreds, and hundreds of people, perhaps even thousands if you consider groups that I have uh, talked to. And everybody has something beautiful to offer. Everybody feels the essence of beauty, of goodness. Everybody has certain virtues and attributes that are the names and qualities of God, like compassion, kindness, forgiveness, generosity. Everybody has these beautiful qualities. These are all the attributes of God. And, um, and so, but they haven't yet connected to a source, a source of love. It's sort of like the wellspring when you're thirsty, you want to go and drink of pure water that vitalizes you and energizes you. So the second type of love is when someone has found that. They've come out of the cave into the light and they've found it. So you have to ask yourself, do you have that in your life? Have you found something that is a source of your inspiration that is the, the water of life for you? If you have, wonderful. You know, continue to continue to get nourished by that. And, and if you haven't, if you're searching, this can kind of provide the direction that you need to go and find that. You need to search and discover and you have to be critical so that you don't fall into cults and, you know, just dogma or something that is just closed minded. You have to be extremely uh, analytical and critical in how you go about identify validating the object and source of love. So this third element of love um, is, as you can see, connected to the second side uh, that I showed you. And finally, the fourth type of love in this ontological categorization is the expression of human love being, human beings show towards each other. So this again is explained beautifully by the master. The love which exists between the hearts of believers is prompted by the ideal of the unity of spirits. This love is attained through the knowledge of God so that man see the divine love reflected in the heart. Each sees in the other the beauty of God reflected in the soul. And finding this point of similarity, they are attracted to one another in love. This love will make all men the waves of one sea. This love will make them all the stars of one heaven and the fruits of one tree. This love will bring the realization of true accord, the foundation of real unity. So, again such a beautiful 
um, passage to reflect upon. Um, the only requirement that you need is, is, is critical thinking and purity of heart, openness to allow yourself to try and understand and asking a lot of questions. And so, like in the past, I always encourage you to, to post your questions, to email me your questions, and I'll be happy to elaborate on these things. It's, uh, it's very difficult discussing these things on a video um, and you have a certain thought process that is going on versus the dynamic flow in a group and there is an exchange that is happening. That's why I love study circles. I think it's just a wonderful place where people can get nourished and, and be intellectually stimulated and then carry those stimulations, the burning of the love of what one discovers into constructive lines of action. Okay, so um, that was, uh, I guess, uh, all I wanted to share. The last part um, is this, this slide that I am going to now lead into. This is more getting into the psychology, um, is how can one develop mature way of loving intelligently. Um, as you can see, anyone can love. That is easy but to love the right object to the right degree at the right time in the right way and for the right purpose, this is not easy. And in fact, it can be supremely difficult, supremely difficult. Um, oftentimes I give the example that, you know, in parenting as parents, um, if your child uh, wants, you know, uh, a lot of candy and if you give just unconditionally, you are actually, as you know, you cause more harm than good. You may, the, the child may feel that you, by giving them a limited amount out of your abundance knowledge of what is healthy and what is not, and drawing some boundaries and restrictions on what they should do and can't do, that is an expression of refinement of love in parenting. Otherwise, if you just let your child do whatever, you know that they're going to end up hurting themselves and uh, later on in life, um, they will also probably come to resent, you know, um, the opportunities that were missed in, in providing guidance. But I think um, we need to think about how to love intelligently. And there are many aspects of this that we will explore in our future video and understanding the different objects of love, both the quality and quantity of love, how to measure that, how to be able to emotionally self-regulate. There's a lot, but I thought in this uh, brief video, I wanted to point out this ontological categorization of love. And I think it's um, planting the seed for further nourishment, for further, hopefully, fruits that we can uh, harvest in uh, discussing about uh, the strategies and emotional self-regulation and our ability to love intelligently. Thank you so much for uh, listening. I appreciate all your support. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Bye for now.